good evening in some cases maybe, um, and uh, welcome to this roundtable on climate change and children in Africa. I'm delighted to welcome you to this virtual um, meeting. My name is uh, Sandy Blanchet, and I'm the uh, director of the UNICEF Office for Relations with EU Institutions in Brussels. We are very honored to have uh, today with us several senior representatives and experts from Europe and from Africa, from uh, UNICEF, the European Commission, the European Parliament, uh, the Development Bank of Southern Africa. And last but not least, we have some youth representatives, including one speaker from Mozambique. Before, um, I will introduce them uh, individually later, but uh, I, I want to thank you to all of them for accepting to share their expertise and views with us uh, today. As we all know globally, hundreds of millions of children are already affected by climate change. This is not a problem of future generation, this is a problem of today's young generation. 500 million children approximately live in flood prone areas, 160 million children live in drought prone areas, and every year about 600,000 young children die of pollution related causes. These uh, figures are frightening, um, but as we know, for many reasons, children are among the most vulnerable populations impacted by climate change and environment degradation. While at the same time, they are also the least responsible for these problems. Interestingly though, adolescents and young people have been among the most vocal stakeholders on the issues of climate change and environment degradation. And they've been very active at local, national and global levels, getting their voices to be heard, but also taking concrete actions to improve the situation. Now, in this global context, we are going to zoom in today for the next hour and a half on the situation of children in Africa and specifically in sub-Saharan Africa. How are they affected by climate change? What needs to be done? What is already happening? And how can we build on these good practices? What could be their role as adolescents and young people as agents of change. You will be uh, able to ask your questions in the chat box. And actually, we, um, we encourage you to share your comments or your questions in the chat box. And there will be, at the end of each panel, there will be time for uh, Q&A. And I will, um, we will summarize your questions, combine them, and ask the panelists to, to answer them. Your mic, as you might have noticed, is on mute and it's centrally controlled, so sorry for that. Um, you're welcome to put your camera on uh, when you are a speaker. It's uh, more lively for all of us. Otherwise, kindly keep your camera off because it's, uh, it just takes too much uh, uh, bandwidth, if possible. And to start with, uh, rather than me talking, let's watch a very short movie to understand better what the issues at stake are.
Thank you. I hope you um, enjoyed these videos that had some uh, very inspiring messages for us. And uh, without any further ado, let me start with our first panel. I'm um, very pleased to welcome Mr. Mohamed Fall, the UNICEF Regional Director for Eastern and Southern Africa. Mrs. Andrea Kulaima, who is the Director at ECO, the humanitarian arm of the EU. Mrs. Monica Silvana Gonzalez, a member of the European Parliament, who has been very active on the issues of climate change, particularly in developing countries. And Mr. Riz Abramo, a youth climate activist from Mozambique. But let me start with you, Mr. Paul, and ask you, um, UNICEF is known to be a child rights organization, so why climate change? What did you lead you to issue a report on climate change and children in Africa? Thank you so much, um, Sandy. And greeting to everyone from uh, Nairobi. I hope that uh, in this difficult time, um, you are all um, sound and safe um, with your loved one. Um, thanks a lot, um, Sandy, for the question. Um, but maybe before I get to the direct answer, um, allow me to first um, thank you and thank the organizer for inviting me in to, to speak today on this important panel, um, speaking also uh, with a kind of double hat. Um, the hat, one hat being my position of working with UNICEF and for children, but the other hat also being what we call the son of the soil um, being born here uh, in, in Africa. Uh, but let me before, I may you go I and mean, thanks all of you and the partner, the colleagues, uh, who are present here, including our colleague from European Union, um, KFW, BMZ, EBSA, UNEP, and of course also our young participant uh, whose future is at stake um, today in this kind in this discussion. I know that since the beginning of this year, the world has been turned apart by um, the COVID-19 pandemic. But as we say in French, um, we should not lose sight of the forest for the tree. Um, the climate crisis existed prior to the pandemic um, and it will remain and it remains also um, the major crisis and the major issue of our modern time, particularly um, for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, as I say earlier, having been born and having grown up in this continent and travel a lot, um, mainly in the Sahel sub-region, I have seen firsthand um, how the degradation of environment and the ecosystem has impacted people's life, including children's, um, in a way you can compare with any other crisis. To come to your question, UNICEF interests come from our mandate to protect children's rights. Um, this is the first time a global generation of children will grow up in a world which is made um, far more dangerous and uncertain as a result of changing in uh, climate and degrading, degrading environment. Um, the role, as we see it, of every generation is not relentlessly um, to take from the head, but also um, to be and to act as a custodian for future generation. And on this front, I can say that in many respects, as an adult, we have failed today. Um, with a high number of floods, uh, major storm, landslide, drought, local swamp, we must already acknowledge that the climate crisis is no longer um, some distance problem. It is one that is hurting children now and now as we speak. It's also impacting every area of work of UNICEF, including health, water, sanitation, education, nutrition, protection, and you name it. Success will come on the back of the generosity of the international community, notably the European Union and other partners. But it will come also from the hard work of government and family and UNICEF presence across Sub-Saharan Africa through its two regional office in Dakar and in Nairobi. Without investing in child responsive mitigation and adaptation solution today in our programming, 
and result for children will steadily decline over the coming years. And all results we have gained and for which we have fought very hardly, whether it is in health, education, as I say, water and sanitation and protection. We want to end, we must also um, draw attention to the disruption to children's life um, caused by the climate crisis. The report that we have put together, I'm talking about children and climate crisis, maps out drought, flood, and cyclone across Sub-Saharan Africa, and have shown that since 1980s, Africa has suffered more than 80 droughts, 254 floods, 130 major storms, just to name a few of the crises that we have seen. This matters, and it matters to mothers, to fathers, and to caregivers. It matters also greatly to children, and it matters to government. It matters also to country where people are seeking better lunch by migration. These are just um, some of the points I wanted to put as a backdrop um, to show why today in our programming, um, climate crisis relates to what we are trying to do for children. Not it's impacting them directly today, but the biggest threat we are facing is to have us reverse or to have a setback on the hardly fought game in the past decade, which comes across health, education, um, protection, access to water, access to sanitation, so on and so forth. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, for making the for making the case and explaining how children are are affected and and why it's important to to take action. And um, as you mentioned, one of our key partners is the European Union. Uh, the Commission specifically. And uh, Mrs. Andrea Kuleima, you represent uh, ECHO, the Directorate General for European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations. Um, obviously, climate change has a lot of um, connection to humanitarian crisis, as we saw in the video. Um, how do you see this? How, what are ECHO's priorities and strategy? Thank you, thank you, Sandy, and thank you, Mohammed, for some uh, very good scene setting with your with your introduction. Um, well, to answer your first question, I mean, Africa is increasingly affected by all types of crises, including climate related ones. And what we see increasingly is a superposition of climate related crises on top of previous climate related shocks on top of uh, structural problems, uh, governance questions, uh, issues of, of, I would say, structural development uh, gaps and conflict. And when these elements uh, um, superpose each other, we face what we call a perfect storm, which is, which is of course, the, the worst case scenario that we, that we can deal with. And I give you a recent example from the area where, where Mohammed is currently based in, in, in East Africa. Uh, this year we have had, uh, within 12 months period, we have had three times uh, massive floods with above average, above normal uh, rainfall related. Uh, and that was something which was unprecedented. Now, of course, in, in when, these, when these rainfalls and these floods have happened, we have responded with our, let's say, normal way of responding as humanitarians. We have provided uh, financing uh, in order to respond to, these, uh, to this situation. We have mobilized the EU civil protection mechanism in two countries, in Sudan and in Niger. Uh, but of course, despite this effort and this response, uh, this is largely insufficient, but it also comes late in the sense that it comes after the event and is not a, a preventative measure. What we see is that most vulnerable populations happen to be those which are most exposed to the adverse uh, effect of climate change. And they are the ones also who lack the resources and resilience uh, to respond. And here I would like to draw a, 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 a just as Mohammed drew a, a link between the climate change element and children, I would like to draw a link between climate change and protection questions. Uh, because what we see in, in such situation is that climate change can fuel negative coping mechanisms for the, for the, uh, for the populations. For instance, uh, harmful practices against girls, uh, early marriage, what we call famine brides, and I think the word reflects it, famine brides, uh, or even uh, or early pregnancies. There is also an increase in uh, vulnerability to uh, gender-based, sexual and gender-based violence. For example, with uh, dwindling water resources, 
girls and women have to walk further away in order to get water, they have less time to spend on education, self-empowerment, uh, and so on. So this is something that I think we need to bear in mind as part of the, of the context. Now, over the past decade, our humanitarian response in places like the Great Horn of Africa has sought to address complex emergencies and man-made disasters, including conflict and displacement, and the drought phenomenon. And we now realize that with, as an effect, as a direct consequence of climate change, we are facing this recurrent flood situation, uh, which means that we have also to adapt the way we envisage our response, our programming, both within humanitarian remit, but also in what we call the nexus, i.e. this remit, which is common to the humanitarian and the development, uh, and the development world. So there are, there are two lines of actions that we, uh, that, we, that we see are important to take. The first one is to uh, tackle the root causes, address uh, climate change, protect the environment, including in armed conflict. Uh, I think that's an important element to bear in mind. Uh, and the second one is to adapt the design of the humanitarian response to, new, to, to the new realities in order to foster resilience, but also to avoid exacerbating the climate related challenges. And there we fall again on this overlapping between protection concerns and, 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 uh, and climate related concerns. And I'll give you a very uh, quick example, deforestation in the context of uh, refugee or IDP settlements, uh, where the fact that the, uh, the population has to go uh, cut wood in order to uh, cook and, and feed itself is having a double adverse effect, one on the forest, therefore on the environmental aspect, but also on their protection. Uh, because the key concern, for example, from, from studies in Congo shows that uh, the, the moment of risk of sexual and, uh, and gender-based violence uh, for girls and women is when they go to get the firewood. Uh, so these are elements where you, if you address one issue, you will be addressing the second one as well. And I think that's a virtuous effect that we need to, to bear in mind. So we have framed our, our, our approach within the context of a renewed disaster preparedness uh, approach. And what is central to this approach is, first of all, risk-based programming. Uh, second is more space for anticipatory actions. Uh, third point is strength in partnership with climate, scientific, and development actors. And the fourth one, one is that we are looking at multi-hazard, i.e. not only uh, natural disaster exposure, but also uh, conflict and protection exposure. And protection has really is, has a central role in this, uh, in this approach. Um, I would like to say a couple of words on the risk-based programming. Risk-based programming, sometimes people think it's about looking at you know, general trends of, of climate uh, change exposure and so on, but it's not only that. Risk-based programming is that, plus the vulnerability assessment uh, that takes place, which can be very granular and which can integrate also this protection element and any factors that increase the vulnerability of, uh, of the populations. Now, we have moved into this renewed disaster preparedness approach uh, based on two, I would say, two, two, two sources of, of inspiration. One is uh, the reality of the work which is being done on the humanitarian aid remit, uh, but also from uh, another side, it's part of a corporate approach of the commission as a whole with the Green Deal. And I know that there is a panel in it, which a colleague from, from DG Klima will address that. Uh, but the European Green Deal aims at making Europe the first climate neutral, climate resilient, environmentally sustainable continent. Um, and it does provide a vision on these three aspects, on the, on the environmental sustainability, the climate neutrality, and the climate resilience. And we are expected, uh, as part of coherence and consistency to actually ensure that this is also reflected in the external dimension of the humanitarian of the uh, European Union's actions. So part of that is uh, doing it through the EU humanitarian assistance through the approach that I have just described. And part of it is also to make sure that it falls within this famous nexus, uh, which links the humanitarian and the development work. And I know that's a concept which is which is, uh, which is uh, key for UNICEF, but you cover both sides as, as UNICEF. In the commission, we have two departments who work separately on it, but who do it in a joint up approach. And it's true that you will see that uh, climate uh, change is really a driving force in the programming for the next uh, stage of development uh, cooperation programs. 
Um, so that is that is part of the of the European deal. Just to conclude, uh, do no harm principle. It's something which uh, which uh, which is a common phrase in the development in the environmental world when it comes to climate change and not compromising the future generations. It is also a key word as part of humanitarian aid, and I think we really have all the potential to making it a reality. I would like to end by really commending uh, UNICEF for for the report. It's a very very well written report. I actually spent my weekend uh, looking into it, uh, and also for organizing this event. Over to you, Sandy. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for for highlighting the complexity of the of these issues, and and how they are interconnected. And that's that's why we um, it requires also complex and interconnected responses. I think you made the that case very very clear. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, Mohamed Fall uh, will have to leave uh, a little bit early, but we know that his colleagues are there in case there are questions to address to UNICEF. Um, and also a reminder that you are all welcome to put questions or comments into the, the chat box. Let me now turn to uh, Monica Silvana Gonzalez, who is a member of the European Parliament and who is the rapporteur of, the, of a rap report on the impact of climate change on vulnerable populations in developing countries, um, which was a very welcome initiative from uh, our point of view. My first question, uh, Monica, is uh, we know that you're, you've been a champion for, for children and um, that you're leading this important report looking at the impact of climate change uh, outside of the, of the EU. Why do you think it's uh, important for the EU to focus on uh, the impact of climate change on vulnerable populations in developing countries? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. First of all, thank you. You uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, invitation to participate in this in this event. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity. Uh, to meet uh, you today to discuss the, the impact of, of climate change on vulnerable population in developing developing country. I am very, very keen to have uh, your views uh, on, on this issue and to work with you to make a real difference in the, the life of these uh, vulnerable people. Um, uh, thank you especially uh, um, to, to Francesca Zaffaroni, Sandy Blanche and, and all team on Brussels, Brussels office or UNICEF. Um, I believe this report is necessary because climate change is generating uh, poverty, conflicts and, and disaster that are forcing millions of people to leave their, their homes. Uh, if, we, uh, if we do nothing about it by 2050, there, there will be uh, more than 143 uh, million people displayed by, by climate change in just uh, three uh, regions of the world, the South uh, Saharan Africa, Latin America, and, and, and South Asia, according to the, the, world, the, the World Bank. In addition, the 80% the of those uh, who are displaced as a result of climate change will be women and, and children uh, who are more exposed to the impact of, of climate change and face greeting related difficulties, such as lack uh, of access to drinking water, health service, uh, food and, and education, putting them uh, at uh, risk from being victim of humanitarian traffic trafficking. My objective uh, at the parliament is to give a political impulse, but also coming operationality, DG ECO, DG DEVCO, uh, war programs, so that the EU face the impact of, uh, of climate change by not only given so that uh, so emergence response to climate displaced people, but also by addressing the root cause. Uh, this is because first, the, the cause are not the direct responsibility of these people, uh, since they are original by the way, by the way uh, of producing in other countries. This way of life is devastating their uh, traditional livelihood. 
Secondly, uh, because the causes can be prevent or reduce and compensate by reduction of greenhouse uh, emissions, by cooperation to support a climate change uh, adaptation efforts, um, by compensation uh, for the mesh of loose because uh, uh, loose causes by disaster. Um, finally, uh, because the the mesh causes to these people varies according to their vulnerability on the inequality uh, in the means to respond accessible to them. In short, I promote this, this report for climate justice and social justice. Thank you. And in the, sec in the second time, continue on my, my position. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, for this very strong call for social justice, uh, particularly for children and women who are not responsible for climate change are still bearing the, the impact of it. Uh, we wish you good luck in your action with the, with the parliament. Um, and actually, let's, uh, let's listen to the, to the voice of these uh, young people. And we are uh, very pleased to uh, have with us Riz uh, Ibrahimo, who is from uh, Mozambique. Uh, Riz has been involved in the climate change movement for some time now. And uh, actually, my first question to, to you, Riz, is what led you to become a climate activist? You're 20 years old, you're just barely out of childhood, but um, you know, what is the situation in Mozambique and in your region? Because we hear a lot about uh, from, from young people in Europe, but what is the situation um, in, in Africa? Over to you, Riz. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to thank you all for having me here and for listening to me. So what really led me to be a climate activist is that uh, it was by seeing in other people, like in other countries, like in Europe, where they're having a huge movement and talking about it and sharing in the media, uh, creating some protests and everything and that's something that we don't really have in here so I felt like why don't we start it if no one is doing it we should so I found some people I came across some activists so I interacted with them and then they showed me how everything works so that's basically how I joined to be a climate activist and uh, I also would like to talk about uh, my experience, in the, the cyclone that happened here. I guess most of you have heard about it, but you don't really know what really happened. So it was on the March 14th of 2019. And the wind started by 11 a.m. in the morning. But at around 11, it was uh, quite normal wind. And it started increasing till 3 p.m. When it came 3 p.m., the, the wind started to get heavier and harder. We started noticing some trees moving, some poles falling off. And with the time, the, the wind started to increase till it was nine and when it was nine it really got heavier that we lost our communication we couldn't communicate we lost our signs and and everything and it started increasing the heavier part that when that was when the tree started to falling the roads were getting blocked some infrastructure started to fall off and that was an authentic chaos. And at around midnight and a half, it slowed down and we all thought that it's maybe over. But after that half an hour, it came back even harder than it was before. That was when everything started to, to, to fall off, cars were breaking, trees were falling off, roads were broken and, and everything. So that was basically what happened. 
And after midnight, we lost all the connections. We lost water, we lost light, we lost all the communication we had. We lost access to the roads. We couldn't go anywhere. So when we woke up in the morning, we couldn't even go out. We couldn't even go out because everything was blocked. It was like, uh, it was like a place. It was, I can say it was a ghost town. There was nobody outside, everything was blocked. And our first preoccupation was to know how can we communicate to other people? How can we know if our family is safe, if our neighbors are safe? That was the first thing that we tried to do. That was to try and open the, the road so we can maybe walk to, to the houses to see if they were all right. And most of the people, they lost a lot of things, starting with infrastructures, places to sleep. Most of them lost. We even had to, to, to take some of them into our places because not all of the houses, they were strong made. And so that was basically what happened. On the, on the next day in the morning, that's when we tried to help those in need with whatever, because most of the people, they didn't take it that serious. So they didn't take, they didn't buy extra food. They didn't buy extra water. So on the next day they were lacking on that. So whoever had more or extra, we had to, to give it to them. So that was basically what happened. And till today, there are some places that we can still see the damage till today, something that we can't fix. It's yes, yeah, so there's some places, some roads, some infrastructures that shows that that really happened. So that's yeah. that's basically about the cyclone. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Vis, uh, for, now, for sharing your your very frightening uh, what must have been very frightening experience with the with the cyclone, and and good to hear about the solidarity that that took place on the ground, and to see your commitment today. So I understand that you, um, some uh, young people in Africa and in Europe came together recently for, to, to voice their opinion on, yes. the, on the different issues um, through what we call your report. It's a, it's a platform uh, that is available to young people to, to share their, their opinions, to do polls and to have dialogue with policymakers. Can you tell us a bit more about this report and, uh, and particularly the outcome on the question related to climate change? Sure. So basically, what's a U report? A U report is an it's an online. Platform. For us to connect and to interact to the young youth so we can ask so they, so they answer us the question in their community so we can have an idea and so we can try to to solve the problem so we can find a a way to to to, to help them in whatever problem they're having here i have the it's the the europe report the total of participants was 91,905 985 and 35% of the of the participants say that the biggest climate related challenge the community is facing is rainfalls and floods so this this was the 35% said about the community that they are suffering from floods and heavy rainfalls so from this we'll try to find a way so a way that we can help them decreasing that or whenever it happens what can we do to to keep them safe and 48 percent said that they have observed lesser food production or availability in the surrounding recently so 40 percent say that and being in my community so we can even compare to the to the previous years we can really see that the production it's really decreasing we can see that last year the, the production was much 
heavier. We had more than whatever we have. If last year we had 80%, this year we're having around 30% of the availability of the foods and fruits and all those. And 43% claim the, the most important action to fight the climate change and reduce damage to the environment in the in the community was to raise awareness. Yes, that's true. We have to raise awareness because not everyone, not everybody in our community is, uh, is aware of whatever is happening in our world, whatever is happening in our community, or they might even know about it, but they don't know how to help or what to do about it. So that's something that we need to raise awareness starting from the school, starting from the colleges, some places that we have a huge uh, concentration of people. And uh, we have 80% here that say they feel that they have the responsibility to tackle climate change. That's, that's also good because it has to start somewhere. It can't start with one or two, three, four person. It has to start with a huge amount of, first, uh, of, of people so we can divide and starting to, to raise an awareness, starting to talk about the, the climate changes in every community as a small groups. And with that, we can also grab some other people who are in, interested on it so we can join and create a, a, a bigger movement. And uh, we have here 33% claim to a volunteer in an environment or an NGO as a role played in green transaction. So with all, all of this that we are talking youngsters who are really interested on joining them, on, on, on joining us in the movement. So that would really be great for us and for our community. And for the last, we have also 33% that claim that the biggest challenge is for youth to support transition, transition to an economy that respects and protects the environment, the lack of capital and resources to find environmental ideas. That's also true. Since we are youngster, we don't really have uh, uh, a capital or resources, we don't even have lots of funds. So we can start a, a, a really huge movement. We might even have some ideas of uh, how to improve some things, but we don't really have that capital. To start the, the, the thing. So that's basically your report climate change, the case of Mozambique. So in the case of Mozambique, here we have uh, in total participants 21,809. 56% of them, they are male versus female that are 48%. 64% say that the biggest climate related challenge the community is facing is heat waves and droughts. That's true. This past these past months, we were really facing strong waves of heat. It's, it's really hot out here and we don't know what really can we do to, to change that, to improve that. So that's basically what we are facing right now. And 48% say that they have observed lesser food production or availability in their surrounding recently. That's true, as I said, in my community, we used to have a huge production of fruits when it comes to, to the season. I can say now it's uh, mango season, it's uh, lychee season. On the previous years, we used to, to see everywhere we walk in my community, we used to have mango trees, lychees and everything. But this past, this past months, these past years, we've noticed it, it's becoming lesser and lesser by the time. And we got 39% that claim that the most important action to fight climate change and reduce damage to the environment in the community 
it was to raise awareness as I also So said, I think we should start talking, starting to raise awareness from the school, the college, because when we implement that to the young people, they'll grow up with that. They'll grow up with that mindset that this is what we have to do. This is the path that we're going to take. This is what we have to do to prevent or end for our better future. And uh, I also have 55% that say they feel that they have the responsibility to tackle climate change. As I said, these are the people that are interested to join the, the movement and to start to, to raise the awareness and start to, to do things to improve our, our environment. I have also 68% say they wish to have an role in green transition in the joining us to the movement and starting to do whatever we can to, to improve our situation. 28% claim to be involved in an environmental committee at school university and to be a member of a youth organization as a play role in transitions in transition. So this is, is also a group of people who starting to, to do a, a movement also by helping by helping people in colleges, by talking about the environment in the colleges, in the schools, to, to talk about how we have to keep the colleges and our environment clean and all those. And for the last, we have 33% that claim that the biggest challenge is for you to support transition to an economy that respects and protects and protects the environment is like of knowledge and skill. Uh, as I said, in our com community or in our country, we, we don't really see on the TVs or in the schools, in the colleges, we don't really see uh, people really talking about it, talking about the, we might even talk about it on school, but we don't do nothing about it. We don't have those activities and stuff. So that's what is the, the, the what is happening with us that's the lack of knowledge and skills starting from the youngsters to the the older ones yeah thank you Th thank you very much uh, Reese, for for you know being the voice of 92000 young people from uh, from africa and and europe on the question of climate change um, we don't have questions in the in the chat box, but let me uh, let me formulate one to our three other panelists and ask them to respond in one minute, if possible. Um, you you've heard the call from from young people. They they want to take an active role. I mean, it's impressive that 71% of them said they want to do something about the green transition. They're aware we need to raise awareness, but they also say they need they need some uh, knowledge and skills. They need some seed funding. So from your perspective, the, the perspective of the institution you represent, in, in one minute, if you could tell us what, what can you do? What are you already doing or what will you do? Maybe I will start with, uh, I think Mohammed has left. So maybe Sam, starting with, uh, with you for, for UNICEF, Samuel, Samuel Godfrey, who is the uh, regional advisor on the water sanitation and hygiene uh, and climate change for uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. What does UNICEF do to help these young people to raise awareness, to acquire skills and access funding? In one minute, please. Uh, thank you so much, Sandy. Um, and, and thank you to all the presenters. Um, UNICEF, of course, is an organization of action um, and building on the words that, uh, that uh, was mentioned by, uh, by, by Andrea or uh, Monica before, um, we need to, to ensure that whatever we are putting forward is, is, is practical and is based on action. So I think three things that we can do um, as UNICEF to support uh, this voice uh, of, 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 of the youth and of the child, we need to partner with them, we need to put them bang in the center of the work that we're doing to ensure that whatever we're doing is practical and it will support them. Secondly, we need to help them innovate. This is a world of innovation. There are many different factors uh, out there which will help us find solutions uh, to some of these problems, some of which are outlined in the report that we're going to discuss in the second part of this, of this session. 
And the third is we need to strengthen low carbon investments. We need to come up with ways that we are bringing these low carbon investments to uh, people like Reese and other children like Reese and other youth like Reese, uh, so that we're actually ensuring, and again, using the words that were mentioned earlier, a do no harm principle, so that we're actually in a situation where we're making a big difference. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sam, some very concrete action. Andrea, from your side and from ECHO, what is it that uh, you could do to support further these uh, children and young people? Okay, well, the first thing is to support what, uh, what Samuel has proposed to do. I think it's, uh, as, as a donor, our role is to uh, work with our partners in order to help them uh, do a better humanitarian uh, humanitarian aid response. But what we do also more is 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 including more and more in our uh, operating modalities this element of resilience and uh, and support, notably to the first responders. I mean, uh, concretely speaking, um, as an example, South Sudan, which is which is an area which is which is uh, affected both by conflict and and by and by natural disasters. Uh, we are planning to establish as of next year local early warning systems that will trigger contingency and preparedness plans for effective response to both natural and man-made disasters. And a key element of that, of that earlier set, uh, warning system in a country which has the governance issues that, that South Sudan has is to actually work deliberately with the involvement of local communities and within local communities, the involvement of early responders and often youth are the people that you find among these early uh, early responders that need to be that need to be supported. Uh, similarly, even for for a country for countries like like Mozambique, in several uh, southern African countries, we are displaying we're having now uh, prepositioning uh, funding of prepositioning. Uh, support to the capacity of the national disaster management authorities and to local actors uh, in order to manage preposition stocks and so on. And in those, those, those are actors that will rely also on, on the young volunteers uh, in order to propose uh, their programs. And I'm not going to go into other programs that ECHO, uh, ECHO works on, such as uh, or has been involved on, such as the EU volunteer uh, core, where part of, of, of the work done with the EU volunteers is to actually work in uh, disaster prone areas uh, to add on to the element of response, the element also of solidarity between uh, youth in, in, in third countries uh, and youth in Europe and within Europe between different, uh, different countries. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, also for this, uh, this very concrete proposals and ideas and, and action that are already taking place. Monica, from the European Parliament point of view, you heard the voice of young people and children uh, any final reaction from your side? Thank you. Uh, only a uh, uh, one minute. Um, I, I am beginning in English, but I try uh, to do my, my, my best. Uh, I think the role of the parliament is to loud uh, political uh, proposal for a comprehensive strategy that you need the emergency and humanitarian response with the medium and long term respond for sustainable development. Its aim uh, is to reduce vulnerabilities uh, and make people more, uh, uh, more their resilience, especially the children, uh, women, and other uh, group more exposed to the impact of climate, of climate change. I specifically addresses in the proposed strategy, strategy a climate action based on gender and, and basing on the empowerment of children through uh, their education in order to prepare them to act and participate in the construction of a low carbon uh, future. As well uh, as to eliminate the discrimination that made them more vulnerable uh, to the impact of climate change. Um, in, in short, I would like to, to work with you, with ECHO and, and DEPCO team to achieve three main objectives. The first is political action to support people displaced by climate change must be given more priority EU level. Uh, we must insist that Europe that, uh, take more a leadership role uh, uh, and, and raise this use of more activity within the, inter the international community. Uh, the second uh, objective is legal 
I know this is more a libre issue, but ideally there should be a new international recognized legal statue for people uh, who have been displaced by climate change. Uh, however, we can also consider how to extend protection through existing international instruments. First, um, and very important, is a financial objective. I consider uh, that a special EU budget line is needed. Uh, this could be done uh, under the Neighborhood Development International uh, Cooperation Instrument and also the Rapid Response and Humanitarian Aid. Uh, for action to limit and, and manage the, the impact of climate change on vulnerable population in developing countries. Finally, the European Parliament Forum, I am uh, encouraging the Union to lead this uh, in, in other international fora for, for funding a solution to, to lack of legal protection. Thank you for, for your attention for, uh, and, and, and continue to work um, uh, together uh, to approve this, this, this report. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Monica, and a big thank you to our first, uh, first panel. We are moving now to the second one. Uh, and uh, we mentioned at the very beginning that uh, UNICEF has issued a report on climate change and children in Sub-Saharan Africa. It identifies uh, the existing and future uh, climate-related vulnerabilities, and it makes recommendations on the most urgent actions that are needed to equip communities, systems, and children to cope with climate changes. Uh, let's uh, see uh, an animated uh, presentation on uh, this report. The climate crisis is a global phenomenon and is adversely affecting children in Africa. UNICEF East and Southern Africa Regional Office and UNICEF West and Central Africa Regional Office have authored a brand new report in 2020 that documents the current and future climate scenarios, the impact on children, and 10 positive case studies of where UNICEF is adapting its programming for children to the climate crisis. The report notes that one in four of the world's people will be sub-Saharan African in 2050. The ratio was one in 13 in 1960. Global climate change and its associated threats are jeopardizing annually the livelihoods of almost 60 million people, largely women and children, living in East and Southern Africa, and 32 million people in the Sahel by floods and droughts. This report concludes that Africa's climate vulnerability is likely to increase, and UNICEF climate adaptation programming will be key to protect the rights and well-being of children. In East Africa, future climatic projections show that the mean temperature increasing range will be between 1 to 3 degrees, with an overall increase in average annual rainfall. In Southern Africa, rainfall is highly variable across the region, with a clear east to west gradient ranging from very dry conditions along the western Namibian coast to much higher rainfall on the coast of Mozambique. This dynamic is highly variable from wet to dry years with longer term variability closely associated with the El Nino, Southern Oscillation and La Nina events. Water resources are essential for all economic, social and environmental functions, with climate related over and under supply impacting many sectoral interests, such as health, tourism, agriculture and industry. Water services are a critical vehicle for multifaceted response to climate change, with climate change, adaptation and mitigation being directly linked with water availability and access. Up to two thirds of preventable illness and death from environmental hazards are aggravated by the climate crisis. And these are experienced by children with the burden predominantly in those aged under five years. Children are exposed to the impacts of climate change that drive inequality and create and prolong those poverty traps. 142 million people drink water from unimproved sources in East and Southern Africa. And as temperatures increase and water becomes scarcer, 84 million children are known to walk long distances to get water and are increasingly exposed to psychosocial, physical and mental health trauma. Children's education is also often offset due to damage or destruction of school facilities, extended disruption of education and limited access to schooling from cyclones, floods and droughts. 
UNICEF climate adaptation experiences are documented in this report through 10 case studies. These range from developing a climate-informed country program in Madagascar, Cote d'Ivoire circular economy and education, building nutrition and health system resilience to climate in Somalia and the Sahel, youth engagement and advocacy in, through the UNICEF Scout Movement Partnership for both youth engagement on climate change in Africa, and reducing UNICEF's carbon footprint in operations in South Sudan through both climate resilient infrastructure, but also climate resilient water systems in Ethiopia. UNICEF is the leading UN agency for child rights that are being affected by the climate crisis in Africa. The future requires increased partnership, innovation and development of technical, human and financial resources to adapt the Africa of today into a safe environment for the children and youth of tomorrow. Thank you. That was uh, quite a um, uh, good overview of this report. It contains actually much more, and I encourage you to to read it if you have uh, if you have the opportunity. Um, let me turn to our, uh, Lars Berndt, who is from the UNICEF Regional Office for Western and Central Africa. Uh, Lars, could you give us an example from your region about what's happening and solutions? Sorry, I was on mute still. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Sandy and all for this opportunity. Indeed, um, given the short time, uh, we will um, present briefly um, one case study from Cote d'Ivoire, basically, which is focusing on extension of climate change, more environmental protection to basically transform plastic waste into construction materials in schools. So I think the video, uh, sorry, the slide will be put up. You can come to the next one. Basically, what is the problem? Um, you will see a lot actually on this slide already. There's some 288 uh, tons of plastic waste, which is produced every day in Abidjan, which is the capital, um, I mean, the practical economic capital of Cote d'Ivoire. And only 5% of this uh, waste is recycled. So you see the kids here on the photo playing uh, with the plastic. Um, this is, of course, a huge health impact, um, not only that 60% of cases of malaria, diarrhea, but also pneumonia in children are due to bad waste management, um, including also air pollution, which um, actually um, is increased due to the plastic incineration, uh, creating respiratory infections, and that has been very well documented by UNICEF in many reports. Um, on top of that, um, and thanks, Andrea, for the holistic picture you, you sketched in the beginning of this um, webinar. Uh, basically, the plastic waste also blocks the drainage systems, increasing also the, the risk of, um, of flooding. And it increases, of course, the breeding ground for mosquitoes. Now, um, how is this linked to education and to this project? Basically, in Cote d'Ivoire, we have 1.6 million children who do not go to school. And a huge challenge is indeed as a, as a select of uh, classrooms. So you see this here also on the picture on the left. So usually on average, um, the classrooms are working at double or triple capacity in low income uh, communities, which is um, uh, putting a lot of stress. Also, uh, you see on the, on the second picture uh, from, the, from the top that these schools are very precarious. So, um, Indeed, um, it is important to, to overcome this education challenge and also um, address the, the environmental protection issue. In that regard, um, basically our country office in Cote d'Ivoire teamed up with a social business called Conceptos Plasticos, which is from Colombia and which uh, set up actually a woman-led recycling market. You see here on the photo as well, the women selling plastic she collected um, to uh, this new factory, which was set up um, end of 2019 in Cote d'Ivoire, in Abidjan, and which indeed produces these bricks. Uh, this is like a Lego system, if you want. It's very easily um, assembled. Um, you can use a hammer and you build it. Uh, they are fire retardant. They're treated in that way. And um, they are of non-PVC plastics. They're cheaper, lighter, and more durable. Then the conventional bricks also, um, they can be actually um, assembled much, much faster. You don't need much training. And in that sense, um, you see here some figures in the middle of the presentation where you see that indeed um, 
uh, an important number of classrooms have already been built, 58. It is uh, foreseen to basically um, uh, build some 528 classrooms in Cotiba at the moment. Um, of course, all this depends on the funding available, but this is, um, we think, an interesting uh, perspective, which also, um, of course, by extension, purports uh, issues of environmental protection in the curriculum and other elements. So it's, it's really an empowerment and awareness raising, maybe also skills building for green skills. And uh, so this is taking place there. Maybe we could move to the next slide. Which is basically, um, I want to give a little bit um, the, um, the wider picture. Um, I mean, how, where this sits in. I mean, if you, if you uh, basically uh, look from on the climate change issue from a perspective of, um, of um, um, what is it, uh, Western Central Africa, the first thing which comes into mind is, is not necessarily climate change. The first problem we see at the moment, at least in the Central Sahel and in and the Lake Chad region in the east of Congo, and I think you will agree with me, the most immediate is conflict, armed violence. Um, we have a lot of um, critical social services disrupted, but actually it's a mix. It's, it's a whole mix of various risks or shocks and stresses. And climate change is one important element, but we cannot treat climate change in isolation. So we would have to actually address indeed the floods, the floods, the droughts, the desertification and other um, events, which are sometimes cyclical, but also increasingly erratic but also have to work on the conflict side and conflict sensitivity, peace building, and also on the COVID containment measures to, to find the right balance, right? So that livelihoods are not impacted. Um, and we have to find indeed um, uh, new alternative and digital uh, ways of delivering social services. This I think applies um, against the, the background of the various shocks and stresses we face in the region. In that regard, um, one big investment is indeed to look into renewable energy access, which on the one hand provides these services, on the other hand contributes to climate change mitigation. And in that regard, we are focusing uh, very concretely at the moment on Niger, maybe also Sierra Leone. It depends really on the availability of funding to support these things, to indeed based on the solar market assessment, uh, teaming up with partners, existing studies, to, to see to what extent we can bring sustainable energy, which has a, I mean, penetration of 37% on average in this region, and also um, reduce actually the climate impact and build actually the resilience of communities and social uh, service delivery systems. It is important as well to, of course, work on the capacities, to the capacities to manage the climate risk um, and other risks, basically also investing in disaster risk management continue to do the evidence building on that one, and then adapt our programs in all the sectors, basically, to the climate challenge. Uh, very concretely, uh, probably most advanced is the, is the wash sector. Actually, by no surprise, I mean, we're talking about climate change, mostly hydrometeorological events, um, where, uh, I mean, a strong commitment has been made by UNICEF for a shift, basically, to more climate resilient futures. Um, we already have a lot of, um, actually, this region, part of the region is, um, is at the forefront on, on using solar to extract water, for example, from boreholes. And um, of course, we use this for vaccine management, uh, cold chain management. Um, but of course, we have to, have to move also in other fields and to health and other fields. So we are working on this one. Um, one concrete aspect is the water severity index, which is being piloted at the global level, but also in our region to improve the early warning. Um, also, we are looking into, um, I mean, indeed, these, these resilient infrastructure, not only climate related, actually, the idea is really it should be really all disaster related. And um, also, uh, we were talking about the nexus early on. Um, indeed, uh, we had concrete examples where, where refugee IDP populations um, were not served to the water tanker, but we tried to continue to to sustain actually piped water supply in, in host communities in Burkina Faso. All this needs indeed engagement. So thank you for the good words um, early on on EU support. I think this will also largely responds to your strategy for Africa, but we need to have, have to expand really the funding for this one, the partnerships. Um, we uh, are counting on green climate funding, but we are not yet accredited. So maybe some support also in this regard would help. 
and I will thank, stop here with thanks. Thank you very much, Lars. I think the example you presented in, uh, in uh, Côte d'Ivoire was a good example of you know, showing the complexity of the issues and how comprehensive uh, our, our solutions need to be. It's not, uh, it's not a simple problem or simple solution. Let me move to the uh, other uh, members of the, of the panel now. Um, and I'm happy to give the floor to um, Maria Soraya Rodriguez Ramos, a member of the European Parliament uh, from the Environmental Committee and uh, chair of the Pan-African Parliament delegation. Um, Mrs. Rodriguez Ramos, uh, our first, uh, my question would be about um, partnership with Africa and climate change are two European EU priorities. How do you see them intersecting, interconnecting? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I would like to, to thank uh, UNICEF uh, for inv inviting me uh, to this round uh, table on uh, the rights of the children and climate change in Africa. Thank you. Um, the answer uh, to your question is yes. Yes, Africa and climate change are EU priorities in, and they are clearly interconnected. African countries, their population and ecosystems are particularly affected and um, vulnerable to negative impacts of climate change. Uh, developing countries, and especially in the African continent, are the first to suffer the disaster consequences of global warming and climate change, while developed uh, countries are responsible for the lion's share of carbon emission. In the last decade, African economies have been growing at an average rate of 4.7%, 4 but the challenge of climate change threatens further economic growth. By 2050, based on the current trends in global emission, Africa's adaptation costs could reach 100 billion annually. These numbers will inevitably undermine the achievement of the objectives set by the agendas uh, 2063 and 2030. Uh, during the 10th meeting of the Africa Union Commission and EU Commission in February 2020, it was very clearly stated by both parties how the implementation on their respective commitment, commitments under the Paris Agreement has to be based on the, on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities in the light of current circumstances. This principle is essential in order to understand what our common interest and the demands from African side are. Like Europe, Africa is not immune to the rapid global biodiversity loss, exacerbated by the, by the effects of climate change. This is extremely worrying since uh, biodiversity is uh, crucial for safeguarding Africa's food security, Biodiversity loss threatens our food system, putting our food security and nutrition, um, nutrition at risk. Um, biodiversity also underpins healthy and nutritious diets and improves rural livelihoods and agricultural productivity. For these reasons, we need to put climate, biodiversity and environmental protection at the heart of the partnership between the European and the African Union, in the line with EU's commitment to the Paris Agreement and the Convention on Biodiversity. The biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis are intrinsically linked and protecting nature is a vital ally in the fight against climate change. The Green Deal sees uh, the EU's role as one of leading by example. 
the external dimension of the Green Deal needs to continue increasing its cooperation with Africa through green alliances. Uh, the next decade uh, is key to preserve and restore global biodiversity and key ecosystem. We therefore uh, call for increased global action and ambition in the next uh, international meeting like COP15. Um, this ambition uh, must be supported by uh, sufficient financial resources. I would like to remind you that uh, in our negotiation for the new financial instrument for development, neighborhood and external action, 45% of the budget would be devoted to these objectives. In terms of uh, strengthening our global action, the Commission proposed in the new strategy, uh, Europe uh, and uh, uh, Africa Union, to establish an structured trilateral Africa Union, European and United Nations to cooperate uh, to, trans, uh, to, to create a um, transformative platform to advance on multilateralism in uh, common agendas, such as climate change. Uh, in, a, in a few words, uh, the main message is the following, uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals, EU and Africa need to opt for a low carbon, resource efficient and climate resilient future in line with the Paris Agreement and increased action to protect biodiversity. I uh, like uh, as a chair of the delegation for the relationship uh, with the Pan-African Parliament, I want to underline that we need to build a deeper and a stronger dia dialogue with our African partners. I'm not trying to, to promote a new uh, EU African cooperation framework unilaterally. And uh, in addition, the coronavirus pandemic has shown us that in face of global challenges, uh, a unilateral response is simple, not possible. Mm -hmm. Health, therefore, means the health of all. In Africa, in Europe, throughout the world, we have witnessed an unprecedented battle against a terrible virus that has taken the lives of, of may, many citizens. The pandemic and its asymmetrical effects have shown the fragility of an interdependent world. We need joint action, solidarity, and work together more than ever. Pol political dialogue is key to address together, hand in hand, the key challenge of the climate crisis in our shared and common planet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Rodriguez Ramos. I think you know your your last points around the need for partnership uh, is is absolutely key, and that's why I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to have this round table. Um, and of course, the importance of financing. And actually, you, you're giving me a very easy transition uh, to our to our last uh, panel speaker, uh, Mr. Mohammed Syed, who is um, with the Development Bank of Southern Africa. Uh, welcome to the to the panel, Mr. Syed. Uh, very happy to to hear from you. And and uh, more specifically, um, since the Development Bank of Southern Africa. Uh, finances many climate adaptation programming in in Africa. Could you tell us a bit more about the some of the current initiatives uh, the DBSA is implementing uh, these days? You will be unmuted. Give us one second. Rebecca, you need to unmute. Uh, it's because you're under the name of Lena Brook. I think that's why we, we lost you in the... Uh, uh, 
Rebecca, can you see? Yes. No. Ah, okay. Now, thank you for putting your logo. <laughs> Sorry for this technical problem. Rebecca, can you unmute? Yes. All right, you uh, hopefully it's fine now. Thank you so much, no problem. Thank you so much, sorry about that. Um, so thanks so much again to the organizers for giving me the, uh, giving the DBSA an opportunity just to talk about some of the uh, initiatives, you know, we as a DFI we're looking at in terms of addressing both climate mitigation and adaptation. So firstly, you know, we, we obviously are infrastructure uh, development bank and we focus on, on, on core uh, sectors, um, namely energy, transport, ICT and water. So from a climate uh, perspective, you know, obviously the low hanging fruit for us has always been on the mitigation side for obvious reasons. I think that's where you see the greatest um, um, uh, potential for, 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 provide, for providing debt finance. And in, in terms of, um, climate adaptation. The water sector is the, the, the area where we believe as the DBSA, we could contribute quite significantly in terms of addressing um, uh, climate adaptation. And our role, especially in Southern Africa, where we obviously have a mandate to, to play uh, across the continent, but our focus is mostly, um, you know, SADC member states. And in recent years, you know, we have acknowledged the, uh, that climate change is obviously central to addressing sustainable development goals. And of course, to meet our own um, mission and, and, and mandate. And as an organ of state, you know, we've tried to um, uh, sort, of, sort of have um, a measurable and accountable climate change uh, response indicators. And to do that, we've drafted a climate um, uh, change policy framework, which our board has approved, where we set various, um, targets, uh, fairly conservative, I should say, um, not um, uh, very ambitious at this stage, but I think post 2022, you know, that um, that should change. So for now, we have a target of um, achieving at least 30% of our portfolio should be uh, very climate specific projects by 2022. And out of that 30%, you know, we we're looking at a 70 30% split in terms of mitigation and adaptation, uh, respectively. And um, what we're trying to do, our approach is to look at a programmatic approach. You know, we're looking at large programs where we can then leverage off our accreditation with the Green Climate Fund. And we've developed a number of initiatives over the last few years um, through our accreditation with the GCF um, uh, to address uh, both mitigation and adaptation. And on the adaptation side, we're looking at um, water sector programs. We've started a initiative currently in South Africa, uh, specifically around water reuse. And um, uh, we're also looking at um, a, a program with uh, um, all the SADC member states around um, hydrological observation uh, um, systems. So it's kind of early warning systems. And we uh, currently uh, seeking support from GCF for project preparation funding to develop a, a, um, a kind of an, a, a platform to further uh, roll out that particular initiative, which started a few years, uh, quite a while back. And uh, last but not least, we've obviously signed a MOU with UNICEF um, to look at how we can partner with um, very strong executing entities uh, to roll out, um, you know, WASH in initiatives. And as I mentioned before, uh, specifically on climate adaptation, the water sector is quite key for us. And we want to do this through partnerships with, um, with national DFIs in, 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 in those SADC member states, but also beyond SADC as well, um, as well as um, you know, other executing entities that can help implement um, these uh, um, you know, uh, water and sanitation projects that have a very strong uh, climate adaptation uh, potential. So climate resilient infrastructure in the water sector would be quite key for us. And then, of course, we have a climate finance facility, which we've started um, implementing specifically in South Africa and um, czar based countries. So Namibia, Lesotho and Iswatini. And our intention is to roll that out um, and, and, and to try and replicate that model in um, other countries uh, in Africa, again, in partnership with uh, national DFIs and, of course, 
um, institutions like UNICEF, which we believe, you know, would be quite key in terms of implementing um, such a model. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mohamed Sayed, for, for this very concrete example. It shows that um, uh, first the role of, of, of financing, obviously, and this was, I think, highlighted by Riz, uh, that this seed money is extremely important, and uh, uh, and also uh, for for some um, yeah, uh, solutions. They, they they are there. We just need to scale them up and identify them and scale them up. Um, with my apologies to Elena uh, Vishnar Malinovska, I would like to give her the floor now. Uh, Elena is with uh, D uh, DG Climate in the European uh, Commission, uh, and uh, which plays a very important role in the, in the European Con Commission in terms of determining the uh, EU policies on the, on climate change. So, um, Elena, if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about the pl EU plans when it comes to developing and implementing the the Green Deal, we've we've heard a lot about the Green Deal already, um, outside of the EU, especially in in Africa and to support resilience building. Over to you, Elena. Thank you very much. I hope you can, you can hear me. Um, I'm very pleased to be uh, on a panel where indeed climate change is a high time topic. Uh, you know, today everyone defines itself as a generation X, Y, Z. Myself, I'm a generation of the Velvet Revolution. I am a half Czech, half Slovak, and uh, I was uh, the one, you know, uh, fighting for democracy. And at that time, we thought that lives will be only linear. And, and then uh, came the environmental degradation and the climate risk we, we are living now in. And I'm 44 now, and since my birth, 60% of greenhouse gases were added to the atmosphere. So you see that during your lifetime, you can see a real impact. I'm also pleased uh, to, to hear about your report and will be really interested to, to read the detail of it, but also pleased to hear always an activist on, on a panel like that. It, it becomes uh, almost a, a rule and a norm. And that's really good because indeed uh, there are 2 billion of children living in the world under you know, 18 years old and many of them indeed in Africa, a, a very young continent. Now, what we want to do with the Green Deal without a sort of pretension that we are doing the best is indeed to react to the, uh, let's say, calls coming from youth movements, because without them, without you young people, we wouldn't have the Green Deal in Europe uh, either. And I think uh, the, the main, let's say, uh, guiding light of, of, the, of the Green Deal is indeed to uh, have net, uh, you know, to have zero emissions by 2050. So to be climate neutral, all what we cannot, uh, you know, uh, reduce, we have to remove it uh, through forests, uh, through technologies. Uh, we want to engage much more with uh, stakeholders and with young people. So uh, we have uh, now, we are about to launch a climate pact that is something similar that, uh, you know, you do already in Africa in connecting with young people and seeing, you know, what are their worries, doing polls, raising awareness. We are also looking for these sort of volunteers or ambassadors who will structure the, the space and who will really lead by example, because without, again, any pretension, an institution like the Commission cannot do so. We really need people who are able and, and happy to talk in the neighborhoods, in the communities. They are known faces uh, much more than any of us. But be aware that also we as officials in the commission, we are very much, you know, uh, committed to this. I'm a scout personally, you know, I do a lot of planting and, and uh, tree planting. And I think this is this is how we can, uh, you know, work and of course educate our children in, you know, um, in, in, in a more ecological uh, way than maybe we were uh, at, at our time. Now, uh, the Green Deal has a very important external dimension because uh, Indeed, you know, we can't do without and we need the others to, you know, move with us in the same development path and not to repeat all the, the bad mistakes we've done. So we will forge a lot of partnerships around climate, biodiversity, circular economy in the future. And this is in line with the whole government, whole economy approach. 
and for the new financing funding for a development cooperation or partnership uh, rather cooperation um, not using the the old terms would be uh, the team EU approach. So Europe comes together with its member states, together with its banks, together with its agencies, and really tries to get as many core benefits as possible. Because I hear you, what, what comes out of the, of the panel, it's not just about climate change, it is also about social equity rights, about child labor, uh, about uh, violation of, of female rights, etc. And, and we believe that by, by taking the, the right targeted intervention and approach uh, to, to uh, such, a, such, a, such a project, for instance, around coca uh, plantation, you can indeed have the transformative impact with a lot of uh, co-benefits. Uh, resilience will be at the heart of what we do, climate resilience, but also, you know, uh, increasingly health resilience. We find there are so many overlapping challenges and overlapping responses. Why are we in the pandemic? It's because there was uh, there was disregard of scientific, uh, you know, views. There was no real international cooperation. There was no real transparency on what happens. And, and here we are. So the same uh, happens with uh, climate responses, climate risks. And indeed, we, we need to use the same tools. We know that in the future, there will be 10 billion of dollars, uh, you know, uh, uh, 10 trillion, uh, sorry, uh, that will be mobilized for recovery and this recovery needs to be green one. We cannot just uh, subsidize the old economy, we need to find a space for the new jobs in a new economy and really, you know, the, the, the time window is closing fast, but it, it will be a, a, a window with a lot of flows, financial flows that will go through re to recovery priorities and we need to keep uh, these priorities being the green ones and, and the ones that, that really uh, countries uh, do, do need. Maybe just to mention a few uh, very concrete uh, intervention areas we have in, in Africa. Uh, first of all, it's around the sustainable uh, energy, of course, uh, because there is a huge uh, you know, amount of Africans that still don't have access to clean uh, energy still don't have access to uh, clean cooking. So Europe has already allocated 3 billion euro for sustainable energy cooperation with Africa, with around 300 uh, projects going on, be it for a uh, you know, small autonomous solar system, efficient uh, cook stoves, investment into micro and mini grid in poor rural areas, but also larger investments in electricity to solar, wind or hydropower. Um, we also uh, try to support Africa in terms of capacity building for research and knowledge, because really the knowledge needs to come from, from, from the African continent. And so we work very intensively on a research and innovation partnership on climate and sustainable energy. Um, there's also an initiative that Europe supports. Uh, it's called Economics of Land Degradation Initiative, where at least 1 million hectares of land with 500,000 of households will be covered by 2025, 2022, exactly to, to help the local farmers and to promote um, sustainable land management. Uh, in the same vein, we work uh, through the so-called local initiative, the local climate uh, adaptive living facility uh, to directly implement the nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. And last but not at all least, we are funding through the uh, UNDP, the so-called uh, Africa Adaptation Initiative, very important, that will um, prepare the next year the Trends uh, in Africa report, a very important overview of, of needs uh, and uh, of, of what happens in Africa so that we can also prepare then projects with having this, uh, this clear picture um, in mind. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, again, a lot of concrete examples. I'm really struck by the fact that there are so many things happening already. Sometimes we just need to share the information. And, and I think your, your point about the, the climate pact and looking for volunteers and ambassadors who would you know, lead conversations in their neighborhoods is, is actually a clear answer to what uh, Riz was, uh, 
was mentioning and, and uh, it responds to the uh, call from young people. That they want to be part of the conversations. They want to be given uh, that space. So, so great to see this uh, connections. Um, there were some questions in the chat box, um, and I think they were actually answered in this chat in the chat box on on the you know importance of uh, uh, engaging with uh, with uh, ECO and DEFCO at, at the at the national level, uh, at the country level, to have this uh, this dialogue, to share information, to share data. Um, so so I uh, I will just um, at this point wrap up the the discussion since we have reached our our time limit, and I know many of us have other calls. Um, I will not try to, uh, to, to summarize the whole conversation. It was far too rich for, for this, but just maybe highlight a, a few points. I think we all, we've all agreed on the clear impact of climate change and environment degradation on children. And this impact has many aspects um, uh, on, on, on them, unfortunately. We've also heard a lot about the complexity and interconnections between the issues, uh, whether it's climate change, uh, education or health or, or environmental degradation, et cetera. And, and that's, uh, I think everybody called during this panel called for comprehensive responses across the humanitarian development uh, continuum, but, but also uh, responses that take into account all these uh, complexities. Uh, and it can be circular economy, it can be a protection of the environment, it can be adaptation or mitigation measures, etc. I think um, this uh, uh, roundtable also, also has highlighted, and I'm very glad of this, the role of adolescents and young people. Uh, they are agents of change already. They want to be further empowered. They want to be given space for their voices and, and uh, support so they can also take action for, for their, in their communities and for their communities. As I just mentioned, there were many good examples of actions already uh, that, were, that are already taking place that were shared. And uh, I, I hope this you found this, uh, uh, that this round table was also a, a place for a useful exchange of uh, information. Uh, from, from that point of view. And, and finally, the, the importance of leveraging financing and resources at all levels, at the community, national and global level to uh, replicate and scale up these good practices. Otherwise, they will just remain uh, nice projects with, uh, with great impact, but on a few number of, of children and people. What we need is action at the national and global uh, level. So I would like to thank you uh, very much for all your um, for all your participation, for sharing your experience, your questions. Uh, and I hope this, can, this dialogue will continue at the national level in Brussels, uh, in the regions, to, to, so we can take actions uh, together for children and, uh, and against the climate crisis. Many thanks and wishing you all a very good week. Thank you.